So we're going to end today's lecture with this last short section just briefly introducing genome assemblies and genome annotation. We know that a genome is very large. It's made up of long, contiguous stretches of sequence that are organized into chromosomes. In the human genome, there are 23 haploid chromosomes and 3.2 to 3.3 billion base pairs. But DNA sequencing is usually limited to a few hundred base pairs using most technologies. Although I should mention, there are some recent technologies that read truly long sequences, up to tens of thousands of bases. In either case, assembly is the process of solving this massive puzzle. How can we infer the sequence of each chromosome from millions of such tiny pieces? While the problem is being solved, it's like a partial solution to a jigsaw puzzle. If you put a few pieces together, you have that one thing that is composed of two or three or ten pieces, but that's not the solution to the puzzle. If the puzzle has a thousand pieces, it takes a long time to do it. Those unfinished products during the process of gene assemb genome assembly are called contigs and scaffolds. As a side note, I'm going to refer to a read as a single sequence. That's the output of a sequencing technology like a capillary electrophoresis or a next generation sequencing technology. These reads are typically no more than a few hundred base pairs. Now, contigs and scaffolds, which are on this slide, have different but related meanings. In a contig, we say, okay, well, here we have different reads that overlap. We have this read here, uh, and we have this read here, and they overlap in this region, and that allows us to infer sequence that runs from the beginning of this read to the end of this read. And that becomes a contig. It's composed of multiple reads that can be stitched together by their overlap, overlapping. You can remember the name as a contig because it's short for contiguous. These are continu contiguous known sequences, and a contig has no unsequenced or unknown bases anywhere in it. Now, another type of partial product of assembly is here on the right, and it's something called a scaffold. An alias for that is to call it a supercontig. So, in this case, keep in mind that the genome sequencing we're going to do here is typically only a few hundred base pairs per read. But there's more. A lot of conventional sequencing technologies or next generation sequencing technologies determine a read from the ends of a larger physical piece of DNA. If we imagine these colored segments here, the blue and the red represent the reads, that's the part of the sequence that we know experimentally. Then it's possible that we might have more information than just the individual reads. We might have reads organized in pairs, as they're shown here, where each read has a mate. So in addition to just knowing the sequence from each end, the two reads, we might also have an estimate of how far the two ends from, are from each other, and we can put that information to use. So let's say we have physical paces of, of DNA that are each 2.5 kilobases. That represents the length from one end to the other. And let's say we're able to read 250 base pairs at each end, and we're able to organize them into pairs. Then we actually have quite a lot of information. We have 500 bases of sequence for each physical piece of DNA, and we know that the two reads for each pair are roughly two kilobases apart from each other. If the reads overlap as they do here on the left, we can form them into a contig. And if the reads overlap as they do here on the right, we can form them into a contig. But in addition, we can also estimate how far apart these two contigs are from each other, and we can put those together into a longer thing, just filling in the middle with the appropriate number of ends, meaning we don't know what base should go at that position. And that's what's referred to as a scaffold. A scaffold may have unknown bases if multiple contigs can be positioned near each other. There are a variety of ways to do this. If you'd like to learn more about assembly, you can take LSM 3241, where we discuss these processes in more detail, starting really in the first or the second week. So an assembly is used as a reference genome for an organism. The human reference genome, the mouse reference genome, and the zebrafish reference genome are such important organisms for science that these genome assemblies are generated and maintained by a consortium called the Genome Reference Consortium. In fact, this is why these assemblies have this GRC at the beginning, Genome Reference Consortium. 
So GRC H38, the most recent human assembly, was released in December of 2013. At the time this slide deck was put together, the most recent patch of the genome assembly was patch 12, but now there's patch 13. Honestly, they keep promising to release the next assembly, which will be GRC H39. We don't know when that release will be, and they keep pushing it back. But remember, the process of annotation takes months, so even after the assembly is done, we won't know the genes and the regulatory regions or those annotations until months later. These genomes are reference genomes because individuals differ from the reference. None of us, <clears throat> none of us has the same sequence as the human reference genome, but the reference serves as a basis for annotation and interpretation. So those three are the ones maintained by the Genome Reference Consortium. But of course, those are only three genomes. There are many other assemblies. What about all of those other ones? Well, those other ones are still considered reference genomes, but they're just not maintained by the Genome Reference Consortium. They're assemblies that are put together by whoever put them together, maybe one particular center or even just a group of scientists in a single lab. And in that case, it's still a genome, and it can still be used as a reference genome that's produced by assembly. But I'm using scare quotes here because this type of assembly may be composed entirely of scaffolds. It's not unusual to see a genome with tens or even hundreds of thousands of scaffolds for a sizable genome instead of a small number of chromosomes. It doesn't seem like a genome, right? You know, if you have an organism that has a few chromosomes and what you know about that organism is 10,000 scaffolds, it seems like you really don't have a genome. But in fact, they're still very, very useful. There's a lot that can be learned from a genome at that level, which is really kind of a partial assembly. Now, after the assembly comes genome annotation. The assembly only produces the sequence, and the annotation provides everything that we can say about that sequence. Annotation is what where we infer what we can about the location of features on the genome, like genes, transcripts, and so on. The genome sent annotation systems that we've already used produce these models, and they're just models, right? The annotations are just models. Using both automatic and manual processes, the best ensemble, the best uh, systems like the ensemble system, the gen code system, and the NCBI system are really complex pipelines, and they take months to run for a new assembly. For the human assembly, the ensemble annotation system is estimated to take about four months. Now, these annotation systems use a combination of different approaches and different information to make these models. There's the so-called ab initio gene predictions, where they're simply predicting where the genes are from the properties of the sequence itself. And another is, well, if they actually have protein or largely transcript sequences that should map to the genome, well, when they do that, the position of the mapping helps infer the positions of the genes, and then they can refine that by manual curation. The process of annotation is, of course, st not static. It's constantly being updated as we know more about, for example, comparative genomics. Now, here's a question you should have, which is, what is a gene? When we consider the question of a gene, how do we define what a gene is on the genome and where the genome is, and where the gene is within genomic DNA? Of course, there are definitions of a gene from genetics, but here we're referring to a position, something that we can annotate on a genome. Well, in eukaryotes, we can consider different types of genes. There are many of them, right? There are protein coding genes, which are usually the genes we first learn about, and there are pseudogenes, which are, well, not functional, but resemble the genes from which they were derived as kind of molecular fossils. And then there are functional RNA genes, like transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, small nucleolar and small nuclear RNAs, microRNAs, and long non-coding RNAs. All of these different classes of functional RNA don't require a protein sequence, but they're still all genes. So what makes a gene a gene when we look at it on a genome browser? Well, we might look at the region that is actually transcribed, okay? So that would begin from the first transcribed base to the last transcribed base in this picture here. Uh, of course, we might also look at the regions around that transcription. We might look at the regulatory regions that surround it. So here we have a ta, -ta box that's slightly upstream of the first transcribed base, and we have a promoter, which where transcription factors bind, and we have more distal regulatory regions that help control when and how a gene gets turned on and expressed. 
In the first exon of a protein coding gene, there's usually a 5' untranslated region, and then somewhere in the middle of the first exon, or perhaps not even in the first exon, there's a start codon that begins translation. And in genes that undergo splicing, there are splice donor sites and acceptor sites that define introns and so on. And then in the 3' exon, or towards the 3' end of a gene, there's a 3' untranslated region and a stop codon that precedes it. So that's all the part inside the window of transcription, and then there's the rest, the stuff out here on either side. Of course, a single exon gene won't have these introns, but it otherwise looks largely the same. Now, reference genome annotation works by defining the gene as everything inside but not outside the window of transcription. If there's more than one transcript, the gene includes all of them. You can think of the gene as the smallest region of the genome that encloses all of the gene products of the gene. So the gene does not include the promoters or enhancers outside of the region of transcription, but does include the 3' prime and 5' prime untranslated region. If a gene has multiple transcript start sites or multiple transcript end sites, the gene region will range from the most upstream transcript start site to the most downstream transcript end site. A short way to think about it is that a gene encloses its gene products. Now, if we want to find genes, we can kind of consider two different classes of approaches. One is the extrinsic approach, which is to use homology. So if we've previously identified genes, we might expect homologs of those genes to show up in our new genome assembly. And you can find those. You can analyze those. And that's very similar to what you did in the first continuing assessment, CA1. The second type of approach is what's called intrinsic. And here we're not relying on previous genes and homology to genes in our new assembly, but we're relying on properties that genes have. For example, protein coding genes have open reading frames and we might be looking for them. For protein coding genes, we might be looking at what the codon usage is in those open reading frames because codon usage is characteristic of an organism. Some codons will get used more than others. We might be looking at uh, promoter regions near the 5' prime end uh, to identify a potential gene. If it has those promoter motifs, then it's more likely to be a gene. And then there are these intrinsic properties of DNA that help identify a likely gene and computational methods like the ab initio methods I mentioned earlier that help identify when those actually occur. Both extrinsic and intrinsic approaches have the potential for false positives and false negatives. But Actually, as we go further each year, we have many more genes identified. And those more genes that we identify help strengthen the extrinsic approach because we can use homology more and more, and that becomes more powerful over time. So that's where we'll end with this very, very brief uh, bit of, the, of that last lecture. Uh, and I'd like to do just a little bit of roundup. Okay, so genome assemblies, that's what we've been working with. They are drawn or they're derived from the pro as the product of a computational process applied to sequencing data. They're not static. They get updated and they get updated from time to time, both in terms of new assemblies and in terms of patches on existing assemblies. Now, the genome assemblies don't actually tell us where the genes are. They don't just tell us where the functional sites are. For those, we have to use genome annotation. And those efforts are large and uh, take a while for a genome, and they're imperfect. So annotation is also undergoing continual revision. In fact, we're going to get different predictions about where those genes are, or where the transcripts are, using different annotation systems. The annotation results depend on the process used to annotate the genome. As the processes improve, they differ less. So over time, the ensemble process and the NCBI process will differ less, but they still differ. Now, uh, as a, a gene, as we've seen, encompasses its products on the, when we look at it on the genome browser, as we discussed a few minutes ago. These large efforts, experimental and computational consortia efforts like ENCODE, they help document and model regulatory elements in the genome as well as genes themselves. When we work with genome browsers, we have an extraordinarily powerful tool at our disposal because they allow us to layer all of that data and all of that inference of the annotations onto a genome assembly and onto the basic annotations that are provided by places like Ensemble and the NCBI. And that helps us understand how genes are organized. 
Now, genome browsers also allow incorporation of user-supplied data, and they incorporate new computational tools. We haven't really gone into depth on that, but this allows these browsers to be extended and made more powerful over time and exploit your own uh, experiments. And this is a great feature because if you're interested in a particular organism and you're aware of where you can find a genome browser for it, you can do a lot of things that might surprise you. And that's where we'll end. Here are some of the references that we've used in this lecture. I encourage you to see them. The Doolittle and Eddy references are critiques of the ENCODE project. This is a, the original junk DNA um, paper. This is, of course, our text that we've been using this whole time. And this is a bit about DNA repeats. So thank you, and we'll see you next time.